that initial like shock that my body went through. I did not go into the hospital thinking I'm going to have an emergency cesarean. I thought I was going to have a natural delivery. I was going to be home in my in my bed with my baby within two days tops. I was in the hospital for five to six days. And the amount of atrophy that just sets in and the weakness that sets in from just being in bed, we know the, the consequences of that as acute care therapists. Not having someone to come and help you walk, not having someone to come and help you like transfer. No one comes and tells the moms that in, in the hospital. Dr. Neha Pandia, thank you so much for joining me and uh, really just being willing to speak about your birth experience and how it shaped you founding the recovery method. I I want to go back a little bit. I am I never considered myself truly a first generation American. My father's from the Dominican Republic, but that definitely did shape um my experiences and how I navigated healthcare and also the education that we had as physical therapists. And I would love for you to share a memory that really shaped your approach or your your um, your decision to create the recovery method and really pursue a change in maternal health care. What was that? What was that memory? So first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I'm really excited to have this conversation with you and share my story. Um, the memory that comes to mind is immediately after giving birth to my son about three and a half years ago, I remember not knowing what to do in that moment. I've always been a very strong, independent person having that control of my life. And for the first time I was vulnerable and in the working hands of other people. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, I got this far. How am I going to get up? How am I going to get better? And I thought to myself, oh my God, I have been reading so much about, you know, being pregnant and, uh, how to take care of the baby. I don't know how I'm going to take care of myself. What do I do now? Um, I remember having conversations with my mom. Um, my parents are first immigrants from India and I'm a first born generation, um, Indian American. And I know that we've always talked about, you know, uh, education and work, but we've never really talked about health. And I never asked the question to my mom about what am I going to do for myself after the baby comes? And I know I asked her plenty of questions about what to do with the baby. I never asked anything about myself. Um, and my mom never shared her story either. So I thought to myself, laying in that bed in the hospital, okay, I am going to ask the next person that comes in. I know a PTOT is going to come by, you know, being a physical therapist myself, I'm sure someone's going to come and help me get out of bed. You know, a few hours passed, six hours passed, eight hours passed, no one came. Everyone's coming, taking the baby, getting their, you know, the necessary testing done for the baby. No one's coming for me. And I thought to myself, that's weird. Like I remember working in the hospital shortly after I graduated PRN and I never thought to myself, well, who was seeing these maternal mothers? And I asked the nurse and I said, Hey, is someone going to come and help me get out of bed? And she's like, I can help you with that. And I said, okay, but can you like, show me how to transfer, like protect my incision. And I remember in that moment, she and I worked so hard. I had to really recall my skill set about how I'm going to get myself out of bed. When you're in tremendous pain, all of your knowledge just goes out the window. And that's when it hit me that there needs to be something here for these moms to really educate them, try and help them get out of bed, try to help them really take care of themselves, try to really just be there as a support and let them know it's going to be okay. You're going to physically recover. You're going to get better. You're going to be able to take care of your baby. Um, and we're going to help you with that. And here is the roadmap to do that. And I thought to myself, you know what, after I start recovering, when I'm home, I'm going to start really digging and just researching on this topic. And when I started, 
I didn't find anything. And that's when I was like, okay, I think that we need to start doing something and I have to take action. And that's when I started doing a lot of the research for the recovery method and finally thought, you know what, let's get it out there. Let's get the name. Let me start finding, you know, um, and networking pe with people that are like-minded and doing this, this amazing work like yourself. I, I want to take a bird's eye view of this because I was also an acute care therapist for a very short period in terms of like my career. I was mostly outpatient women's health, pelvic health. And something happened uh, a year ago, uh, June of 2023, that just even changed my mindset about the work that we were doing to bring that help to mothers because we knew most maternity hospitals were actually baby centered in terms of their care. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that when you have a baby centered care model, you do often forget about the needs of the mom, especially if it's after a cesarean section, right? And when we think of a cesarean section, we think of still under birth, we don't put it under major abdominal surgery, mm -hmm. you know, where, where that care would be offered on other units. And so something happened last year, which it involved my father, who's again, always been independent in terms of like medicine, never wants to take it, you know, doesn't go to the doctor for anything unless it's like truly an emergency. And while I was actually speaking on this very topic on the acute care uh, panel, it was a, a kind of a webinar we were doing for the American Physical Therapy Association. He was being rushed to the emergency room for an obstructed colon. And about five days later, we found out he had stage four colon cancer. Oh my gosh. And the moment that I think I saw his true breaking point was just the agony of just trying to get out of bed. Yeah. And the trapeze that hung over his head, any acute care therapist would cringe about that, that force of pulling after not a major abdominal surgery. Yeah. He didn't have a cesarean section. He had robotic small incisions all around his abdomen that still were incredibly agonizing. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I was thinking of all this work I'm doing in maternal health and women's health after post cesarean um, uh, section, uh, cesarean hysterectomy, hysterectomy, all of that. Dr. Pandia, when I, when I think about the frustration that he had and the advocacy that I had to have, even as a physical therapist, all of that went out the window. I was his daughter. Mm -hmm. He was now a patient and we mm -hmm. couldn't get a physical therapist in the room after four requests. The fifth request, they finally brought someone who helped and showed him the log roll because yes, could I have done it? Absolutely. Did I try? Absolutely. Still yeah. a daughter of an immigrant. There's, there's, a, a, there's, a, there's a difference there. There right. Is. For anyone who just knows. And um, and so just taking this bird's eye view of just healthcare, but then really from that perspective, I want to ask you, as a former acute care therapist, did at any point you think, well, I should know what to do? I'm gonna try to do this by myself. Or did you reach that point of anger and in indignation very quickly, even during your hospital experience? The first time I think that I reached that point of frustration, um, it was more of navigating this new baby and this, you know, I had a very traumatizing experience my first time amidst COVID, right? Um, after laboring for 28 hours, I had to have a emergency cesarean. I like had not eaten. I had not drank any water for nearly like 18 hours. Um, it's, you know, it was a very traumatic experience to a point where on the operating table, I was throwing up. I, my blood pressure dropped so low that I completely passed out. And the only way I was revived was this amazing older midwife who was like, just put the baby on her. And she put the baby on me. And all of a sudden my blood pressure just shot up. Like it was the separation from the mom and the baby that caused my blood pressure to drop that low. I, I, I had like anemia. So I know that a lot of it was like the blood loss, but that initial like shock that my body went through. And that was the very frustrating part for me because 
that was not expected. I did not go into the hospital thinking I'm going to have an emergency cesarean. I thought I was going to have a natural delivery. I was going to be home in my, in my bed with my baby within two days tops. I was in the hospital for five to six days. And during those five to six days, the amount of atrophy that just sets in and the weakness that sets in from just being in bed, we know the, the consequences of that as acute care therapists, right? But not having someone to come and help you walk, not having someone to come and help you like transfer or even just do basic mobility exercises for your legs, um, just bedside, right? We do like in the ICU, we, we send our therapists and we do passive range of motion, any sort of exercise just to keep the joints moving, but no one comes and tells the moms that in, in the hospital. Right. Um, and that was the very frustrating part for me. So the second time when I was in the hospital, I took charge, I took charge of my own recovery. The best person to advocate for you is you. I took charge in, in the spec that I knew what I needed to do. I went prepared with, you know, the exercises in my mind that what I'm going to do, I was sitting there doing like long arc quads and ankle pumps while feeding my baby. What are I long would... arc quads for, <laughs> for people who don't, who've never heard of that term? Long arc quads is when you're sitting on the bed and your legs are dangling and you're extending them. Right. Um, I actually have a video. My, my husband took many videos of me from my second time and I said, this is what I'm going to use and show to people that you should be doing things like this in the hospital as you're waiting, you know, to be discharged, as you're waiting to be recovering. Um, the second time around, I asked my doctor, I want to be out of the hospital in a day. And she's like, well, you had a cesarean. I said, I know, but I'm also taking charge of my own recovery. And I know what I need to do this time around. And that's exactly what I did. And I came home and I continued to do what I needed to do. Um, that said, I'm also a provider, right? So I knew what I needed. Many women don't, not the first time, not the second time, not the third time. They don't know exactly what kind of, you know, ac like access that they, they really need. They don't know what's out there for their recovery. And that's part of what the recovery methods mission, mission is. We want to help moms get access to all of those resources after they're discharged to home, right? Um, because that's that's going to be what helps them in the long run. So, I interviewed um she she's a TEDx speaker internationally, um, global speaker, and she was talking about her cesarean section the first time, and her second experience sounded a lot like yours. Like she knew the second time, and and, and she even you know, men mentioned this in the interview is that the second time she wasn't as great of a patient, but to me, she was the best, you know, mm -hmm. patient at that point because she was informed. She was armed with information. And yeah. so she knew what would benefit her and what wouldn't. What is interesting, it was like night and day from her first experience where mm -hmm. she was, um, talking about how she went home in a Camaro and, and, you know, no one had informed her yeah. that a really low, um, car like that would be an issue after C-section. She wasn't planning on having the C-section. So she just had the car that was going to always pick her up from the hospital. And within a week, her incision opened, you know, because I mean, how, you know, this as a mom, how many days after any birth does the pediatrician usually want you to bring your baby yeah. you know, to, to the office, like leave yeah. your own recovery where mm -hmm. you should probably be in bed. I mean, we know in, in, in certain Asian countries, moms are not leaving the home for probably the first 20 to 30 days. Mm -hmm. You know, we know that, that, that culturally we're not delivering culturally competent care for mm -hmm. people who come to this country. You know, mm -hmm. and, and are used to a, a way of life and a way of being cared for. And mm -hmm. so to have a baby's appointment, you know, that newborn appointment within the first three days after birth, and then you're going home in a Camaro, no wonder she was in the emergency department after just five or six days after her birth, after a cesarean birth with an open cesarean mm -hmm. incision. And and, and I, I think about like the recovery method that you're creating and only someone who 
Really, I mean, to, to, to have been thinking about how this could be different for other moms who don't know, it takes a very incredible person to just go there, right? Yeah. While you're still recovering, that's incredible. I think in, and now I'll share my story with you a little bit more in depth. Um, my first time, my recovery, again, I, I will say, I didn't know what to expect. There was, in my culture, it is a big stigma to talk about physical recovery or mental health. Um, the expectation for Indian women and for generations has been, so what, you had a baby. Like, let's get you back in the kitchen. Let's get you working again. Let's get you becoming like, you know, doing the chores that you normally do, the domestic things, taking care of the baby is just another thing, right? And that stigma continues on, right? Um, doesn't matter what country we live in, what clothes we wear and how educated a woman becomes, that stigma still to this day, like my mother does not ever not remind me to take care of my husband, my grown 35 year old husband who can definitely take care of himself. There's a stigma that these, these generations push on you. So knowing that and not having the information about how vulnerable I was going to be and having to now rely on other people to take care of me. I didn't expect a lot of the, you know, the results of the cesarean, um, not being able to lift, not being able to move or walk. Um, aside from all of the physicals, um, the mental toll that the hormone fluctuations take on you, they don't talk about that with you. You're crying. They ask you what's wrong. What's wrong. I don't know what's wrong. I don't know what to tell you right now. My hormones are coming down. That's what's wrong. And instead of feeling more soothing, it's like the continuous, like, stop crying, stop crying. Your baby's right here. Stop crying. And it's like, I can't, you know? So over the weeks that really took a real big toll on me to a point where I, you know, started researching and Googling and how I'm feeling and went down so many rabbit holes. And I remember that would make me cry even more because I'm, I'm searching on Dr. Google for answers that are there, but they're just so beneath all this other information and jargon that it's hard to access that. And I think that that is a big, big like factor that plays into maternal uh, mental health is when we start trying to find the answers for ourselves, we start going into these other avenues that push us further into those mental health issues or physical health issues. And my mental recovery, like really took a toll on my physical recovery, right? I wasn't in the mental health space my first time around to really help myself. I took about 10 weeks of counseling where my first session with my therapist, Jennifer, where she literally just put a box of Kleenex in front of me. And the entire time, all I did was cry. I didn't, I barely spoke a two sentences to her. And all I did was cry because there was this pressure of physically recovering myself, this pressure of being able to take care of my baby, this pressure of figuring out how I'm going to go back to work as a physical therapist. That is a challenging job. Right. Um, and so there were so many different factors. And I remember in that time, like, I just wish somebody had told me what I was going to, what was going to happen to my mental health after that I could have prepared a little bit better. I could have read a little bit better. Um, I could have, you know, made my, myself a little happy bag that I did my second time. I made myself this little happy bag, which was like, okay, the foods that I like, the, the, the books that I like, the list of shows that I wanted to watch. I made myself a little, like something to go to where I knew that if I could just, I'm going to cry, hormones are going to make me cry. But if I could just access that, I'll make myself feel better. Um, and I just wish that someone was around for the first time. And when I was going through that, I remember feeling like, I don't want anyone to ever go through that, what I went through. So if through the recovery method, I can just help one mom, even just one mom and give her the ideas and the basics and just give her the reins to her own recovery. I feel I will be successful. And with that, if I can at least get some awareness, you know, not just in the Indian culture, but any culture that has the stigma around conversation 
um, regarding physical and mental health recovery for postpartum women, I want to help those people open up their voices and break the cycle of expectations that are on these women. So. Dr. Pandya, wh- how early is like, wh- how early is too early or how early should women be able to access some type of recovery um, plan, you know, and, and it, whether it's rehab, I, I want to really dig into what the recovery method is. But mm-hmm. in my mind, I'm thinking of even pushback that I've heard from other acute care therapists saying, you know, it just feels too early. They're bonding with the baby. I shouldn't go into the room. Whereas they would never say that <laughs> for someone after, you know, um, any other major surgery or a stroke or a spinal cord injury or a knee replacement. Like we offer recovery options to people because we don't know what they're going home to. So we we try we 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 should, but we try really hard as health care providers to not make assumptions about mm-hmm. people, to not like let our own implicit bias come into the healthcare system. But yet we see it every day with on the maternity unit, and we think that's acceptable to to have implicit bias that keeps us from offering our care. So I, I really want to know from your experience, having had two major abdominal surgeries for your birth twice, how early, is, you know, would would be ideal to have offered been offered a recovery plan from even a rehab therapist? I would say immediately. Within that first day, um, I know that having gone through two cesareans and having done research, we push mothers after their abdominal surgery. It is okay for them to move. It is okay for them to transfer, get out of bed, change positions. We actually encourage that. And having a rehab therapist who is a specialist in this, in the hospital, that they do this for other, other types of medical diagnosis is I think the best avenue to go through. But here's the thing with rehab therapists. And this is something that I also have had conversations with rehab therapists on is there's a, there's a certain bias, right? That rehab therapists have that they can only see a certain amount of patients and do a certain amount of things. Rehab therapists forget like all of the skill sets that they have, that they're not utilizing on a daily basis um, with the, their, with the type of patients that they see. So they're kind of avoid the, you know, postural conversations or just like the generic exercises or just, you know, just the, the support kind of, uh, mentality that rehab therapists are known to have. They, they focus on that transfer gate ambulation, you know, get them out of the hospital. Right. And I think that that mindset, if, rehab therapists were just to open that and shift that mindset just a little bit, they can open a door to all of these different ideas of how maternal recovery can look. Now they can be participants of, you know, giving them the partial education, giving them the reins to here are all the sources that you can access. There are now telehealth options so that if you don't want to do in-person outpatient visits, you don't have to. Here are, you know, some, some, um, ideas on some mechanics and pillows and abdominal binders. And what do abdominal binders even do for you, right? Like those types of questions, if they can just be there to answer that and not specifically worry about just ambulation, just transfer. I think that that is what will drive these rehab therapists to deliver care immediately. And then as soon as the mother comes home, I'm trying to push for an interdisciplinary approach when it comes to postpartum care. Um, You know, World Health Organization says we have to also have a seven to 10 day visit with a provider and having an interdisciplinary approach includes a PTOT that have access to patients in their homes. And we can use those providers to deliver the seven to 10 day visit and then use that to bridge the gap so that these moms are finding ways to get into outpatient care centers, whether it's physical therapy or holistic centers or even counseling, right? Like find ways to get themselves the care that they need at that four to six, uh, four to six week mark when they see their provider and get clearance for it. So um, I think that if we were to start this ball rolling kind of 
immediately after the mom has the baby, it will lead. It's like a, it's a snowball effect. Really? That's what it is. We were, um, discussing this in a, in another forum, but, uh, work in terms of like the maternal rehab work that's, that's been probably in our conversation circles a lot more than the public eye. Like not many people know about, um, even rehab being an option in the hospital after birth, you know, in terms of like percentages, there's, there's less than 3% of hospitals in the United States that it would even offer a rehab therapist, um, that have someone on staff ready to go. And so, you know, when our, our, this topic came up in, in the Atlantic, it was published in the fall of last year. One of the comments um, that was in the publication in response to a physical or an occupational therapist helping a mom or assisting with their recovery on the maternity unit, I believe it might have been either a midwife that was also um, interviewed. Uh, she basically said that there doesn't need to be more members on the maternity care team than there already are. Like adding this extra service that we don't really even know, especially for an occupational therapist, we don't know what they do. And a physical therapist, that just seems like that's extra care that's not needed. That was literally one of the comments um, within that same publication that was really questioning from a public sense if we could actually be saving lives on the maternity unit as uh, you know by offering women rehab. And so from your standpoint, when you have that kind of um, response to having a recovery plan uh, from a rehab therapist on the maternity unit, Nay, I, I do. I want to know from your standpoint. Do you what? What is your response to a nurse or an OB provider saying this is unnecessary care? We don't need this in the hospital after birth. I'm glad you asked that question. Um, and I'm just going to pull this statistic that I read and was very interesting to me. Um, compared to other developed countries, um, the ratio of OB guides and midwives who have the most information that they can share with moms on their recovery for every 1,000 births by country. Germany, total 57 for every 1,000 births. France, 41. United Kingdom, 54. United States, 15. So if you were to tell me that we don't need any more people on that postpartum care team, I'm going to have to disagree with you because this is straight research and statistics that show that there just aren't enough providers. And I'm not blaming, you know, like we need more obstetricians and gynecologists. I'm not saying that at all. I'm what I'm saying is include another discipline when you have that available in abundance and utilize them, right? Utilize it and produce some type of a change that you will see the effects of that immediately. In fact, France has this entire guideline about how to incorporate rehab therapists and look at how much, you know, more efforts they're putting in towards postpartum care for women. In fact, that is something that is constantly being published about, um, whether it's in articles or whether it's in journals, but they are doing something. United Kingdom, same thing. They, they, um, created this entire guideline surrounding postpartum care and how to have multiple disciplines that was published in 2017. So other countries, they are doing something, right? So when you sit there and say, we don't need any more people, but I beg to differ. Why are women the most, you know, statistically highest in any sort of doctor's visits or any sort of, you know, obesity uh, scales or in just in lumbar pain, low back alone, like women have a higher ratio of low back pain than men do. But these are all like statistics that get pulled later in life for women, but it starts early. It starts that at that postpartum when they could have gotten that care to avoid being a statistic later in life. And I think that that is how we need to shift our mind is let's not talk about how many people we're adding. It's the value and the quality we're adding, right? Um, you're right. A midwife and an OB-GYN is there, 
but how much time are they able to devote to the patient when they have a shortage of of ratio of ob and midwives to to a uh, thousand births, right? Like there is a huge ratio difference and those doctors and midwives have to spend very short amount of time with this mom because they just cannot go through the entire list of patients in one day. So add somebody else and, and there's no, there's no harm to it right? What is the downside of it? That that's what I want to ask when they, when they ask me this question, it's like, what's the harm, right? What, what are you, what are you not going to get out of it? So that would be my reply to them is let's look at the statistics and find a, a better way to shift our mind towards the positive versus thinking the negatives right off the bat. That statistic that you just read, where you started with Germany, France, I think you went to the UK. What's interesting about that particular statistic is that it also gives the number of midwives in those countries Mm -hmm. in proportion to a 1,000 births. And when I saw how many midwives exceeded the amount of OBGYNs in -hmm. those countries, they had so many more midwives covering pregnancy, uh, labor and delivery, and postpartum care than we did for OBGYN. So you started with, I believe it was in the 50s and the 40s in terms of OBGYN providers, but midwives, I think for some of those statistics were sometimes double the -hmm. numbers. Um, For the midwives uh, providers and for the United States, people... I don't know that if people are computing like the ratio of that, that means that one OBGYN could be seeing easily between 40 or 60 patients, you know, in, in terms of just like who they're in, in charge of their care, who their their point of care provider is. And so no wonder why your visits are so short and you feel like you haven't gotten the information or that mm-hmm. postpartum care follow-up visit is only one, you know, in terms of all the prenatal appointments that you would have had. And then the mid the midwives in this country are even less than mm-hmm. that. We have less midwives than these other countries that you mentioned. And then compared to their outcomes, did you get a statistic of like what Germany and UK and France just rough rough estimate compared to their maternal um, injury and, and mortality rate compared to the United States? Oh yeah, you, but, yeah. Um, so I know for us, like, that's something that's always talked about, like maternal mortality is, is, you know, is substantial. It's been growing, obviously the percentage wise, you, it's so hard to see it in percentage when you're saying, okay, it increased from like 2.7% to 3.2%, but that's a big difference. That's a 0.5% difference, right. Um, compared to these other countries that are really working to minimize that. And it's interesting that you bring that up. The midwives ratio for every 1000 birds in the United States, it's four. We're not even in the double digits. These other countries are in the double digits and we didn't even make it there. So it's, it's really difficult for us to say that we're giving mothers access to providers and access to information and education. We're really not because we're not doing them any justice by saying, Hey, we're not going to include another provider in this because we don't need it. You'll figure it out. You can, you know, ask your doctor or ask a midwife about it, but if they don't have the time to give or devote to you because they have another 40, 60 patients that they have to do, how is that going to benefit anyone? Right. Um, And so it's, it's, I'm glad that you, enjoyed that statistic a little oh, bit. Oh, I, I did. I have to say something. Um, this happened just a, just a few weeks ago. I was at this um, this beautiful like outdoor light show and, uh, and this woman in front of us, she was being attended to by her friends, but she's like on the ground. It, it, it was very obvious. She was probably inebriated, whatever it was. Okay. She's on the ground she's they're having a tr- you know trouble getting her up you know to her feet again. And she gets so angry because, I mean, you know, also like my group, we were health providers. So we're like, we just want to make sure that she's okay, seen is safe, you know, just because we're we're kind of assessing like what's what's actually going on. And she just gets angry and yells out, I'm fine. You could keep walking. 
I don't, you know, you just stop staring at me. I'm fine. And it's just like, for whatever reason, I, I, when you brought up that statistic, I, I often will joke because a lot of, a lot of my um, closest colleagues, you know, are OBGYNs in this space. Like this, this has been over several years that we, we're champions of like what you're doing with the recovery method. You know, not OB, all OBGYNs are just totally pushing us back. It's just the majority of of them are. You know, we have to just like be honest in this country. We are not a mother centered uh, model model of care, and so we have the majority of OBGYNs not incorporating rehab on their teams. Mm-hmm. And they're drowning and they're on the floor and they're yelling out, I'm fine. Like that's that's the analogy that I just uh, take from that is that you're yelling out that you're fine and you're not. And now your patients are suffering. So get help, like yeah. partner with with what you're doing. And and that brings me kind of my to, to bring this all together. What do you want? Um you know, OBGYNs, maternal care providers to know, OB nurses, other occupational physical therapists. What do you what do you want them to know about the recovery method? How can they start incorporating this now in, in uh, on the maternity unit? I think that having everybody be on the same um, on the same pace is very important. Everybody needs to be involved when it comes to producing change. OB guides, uh, midwives, um, even lactation consultant, everybody has to be on the same page when it comes to producing change, right? Um, what I want them to know is that we're, our, our goal is not to just push for something that is going to help one or two people. It is to help, you know, at least like 75, 80% of women, if that, if not more, right? We know that from statistically speaking, 100% of women can uh, benefit from any sort of postpartum recovery, right? Um, Of that, the 32% that go through cesarean, like they as well definitely need to have some sort of postpartum recovery. And OB-GYNs can agree with that, right? Um, They need to understand that our mission is to help their patients. It is for betterment of them. So these moms can feel comfortable and recover in their own space and also, you know, be, be okay with having another baby and not get traumatized or, or deferred from it, from their first experiences. Um, so it's essentially what we're, what I'm trying to push for. And what I want them to know is that it's only to benefit the, the greater good. It isn't something that we're here to just, you know, advocate for, for very few people. It is for the global good. Every mom in this world has grown a baby the same way, you know, it, 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 and through delivery, whether it's vaginal cesarean, we all go through those postpartum symptoms. Um, and what I want to tell ob guys is when we start framing it as a postpartum period, um, unfortunately, we're putting an end. A period means that there needs to be an end. Postpartum is not a period. There is no end to it. There is only antepartum and postpartum. It's like if there's a AB, AB uh, or BB, which is before baby, and AB, which is after baby, right? So postpartum continues for the entirety of that woman's life after they have a baby. So if that mom is coming to her her next visit, which could be five years after she had her last baby, she may still be feeling those symptoms and, and to really push for, push for them to still continue to use the recovery method and really seek the help that they need, that they may not have had time to do it before. Right. So essentially the recovery will continue throughout that mom's journey through her postpartum journey. It isn't something that they need to do like at only at that six week mark, they could do it six months later, six years later. And what I want to just essentially help the ob guys realize is again, this is for the greater good. Dr. Pundia, how can people get in touch with you and, and just learn more? Like where, where, where's the greatest touch point really to be connected and stay connected with your work? I think it's transformative. And I think you're absolutely right. We need it. And I want, I want more because for me, what you're talking about is so mom facing It's breaking down information that they would otherwise be on the internet scrolling, trying to find something and they're getting in a deeper hole. 
And so far, what's out there, what I've contributed um, has really been provider facing, has been for therapy, you know, um, to really get on board onto these teams and, and getting the team. But the most important person on the team is the mom. And I just don't feel like there's anything out there that's really directing her to know what she needs immediately within the first two days, not after six or eight weeks where she's been suffering, right? Or navigating this alone because she's expected to. So mm -hmm. how can people get more information information about what you're doing and get connected with you? Um, I, I love that you asked that. I Anybody who is as enthusiastic or passionate about advocating for women can definitely join our mission. Um, our goal is to eventually, with the efforts of even enhanced recovery after delivery and the pelvic health network and any other entities that are out there that are advocating for women's health, we want you to join our mission in really helping us establish some certain guidelines that we can present someday to, to really change and reshape our country's guidelines on postpartum recovery, really establish that these other developed countries have something like that for their mothers. We need to have that for ours as well. Our moms deserve better. And for that, I would love if you, I will give you my personal email, please email me, get in touch with me. Um, I'm more than happy to, you know, hop on a call, hop on any, any form of communication with you so that we can really work together and, and, and really help these mothers. Let's Excellent. do it. All right. I'll share all of that. Um, definitely as part of this video, uh, LinkedIn, I think is really how we connected yes. and what That's an right. underused platform that platform has really connected me with um, hospital leaders, with maternal health advocates that I, I really, I don't think that um, it would have been very hard to connect um, through other forums. And so thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your mission, Absolutely. your story. And I can't wait to see where it goes uh, within the next year. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for the time.